Hello, welcome to Financial Insider Weekly. I'm your host, Michael Gray, CPA. My guest today is Robert E. Timmerman Jr., who I'm just going to call Bob. And uh, Bob is an estate planning attorney here in uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, he also handles incapacity planning and estate and trust administration. Uh, he's the managing partner and founder of Timmerman, Selly and Coleman, LLP. Uh, which is located in San Jose. Bob received a uh, bachelor's degree in economics and political science, magna cum laude, from Boston College in 1975, and his Juris Doctor, magna cum laude, from Santa Clara University in 1980. Uh, he's an active speaker in the estate planning community, including the Jerry Kasner Estate Planning Symposium presented by Santa Clara University. That's coming up here uh, at the end of this month. Uh, we're recording this on September 20th. Uh, he also talks for estate planning councils, bar associations, and has contributed chapters to books, including California Estate Planning, published by Continuing Education of the Bar. And Bob has also participated in writing the rules of the court of the Santa Clara County Probate Court. On a personal note, uh, Bob is an avid cyclist and quite an athlete. Uh, in 2009, he rode his bicycle 4,300 miles across the United States and Canada, taken numerous other trips. He told me he just uh, took a trip uh, biking in Norway, and then he's getting ready to uh, take another outing to New Zealand. So he loves these uh, biking adventures. And um, let's see here. Uh, he also heliskies every year and plays amateur adult hockey. So, but quite quite the uh, the buff guy here. So Bob, thanks for joining me today. Mike, always a pleasure. Okay. Thank you for having me. That's my pleasure. So today Bob and I are going to talk about I'm a trustee, now what? And uh, as we get into this subject, I want to caution our viewers that we are discussing administering a trust after a death. Uh, other considerations will apply for other scenarios like special needs trusts and so forth. Uh, also, uh, we want you to consult with an attorney when administering a trust. Uh, this is a really big topic, and so we can only scratch the surface. It's the, intended to be uh, a place to start a discussion with your own attorney. Also, uh, Bob is a California attorney. I'm a California CPA, and uh, some of the rules related to trust administration can vary uh, from place to place in, in other states. And some people might even watch this from other countries. Who knows? Okay, Bob. Here's a good one. Some people think that, well, I, I made a living trust. Nothing needs to be done, you know, after I die, right? <laughs> Not exactly, Mike. Have you um, heard this before? <laughs> I have heard it, uh, <laughs> not by our clients, because uh -huh. we educate our clients, uh -huh. uh, but certainly by uh, others who have had trust drafted, um, sometimes by lawyers, sometimes by um, using Nolo Press or over the Internet and just drafting their own trust. Right. Um, truth of the matter is there is a lot that needs to be done following either an incapacity of the trust creator, mm -hmm. who in California we call a set law, or certainly in the event of death. So the successor trustee is the person who is responsible for administering that trust. Um, I could itemize our agenda, which is mm -hmm. you know a few pages long in mm -hmm. our first meeting, as to all the action items that my trustee must take uh, within a relatively short period of time. Right. So um, I've gotten together with clients because, well, uh, in many cases, their CPA is the first person that they go to, and then we say, okay, you need to get together with your attorney. But, uh, but in, in many cases, I'll say people are in shock uh, when I tell them. Because during your lifetime, the trust is a little bit like a will. It's just a document that's sitting there on the side. But suddenly, things happen uh, after somebody passes away. And, and there's this thing that's called fiduciary responsibilities. And maybe we can talk a little bit about that as we go along. But anyway, uh, so 
this is a, a major thing, really, that we're talking about, and, and a big job that people are taking on. Well, part of part of what's important, Mike, is the creator of the trust. While they're alive, there really aren't any special responsibilities. Mm -hmm. If I take my house and I put it in my trust, and my trust is revocable, and I'm the beneficiary, the purpose of that was just to keep us out of court mm -hmm. following my death. But when I die and my wife takes over the administration for the benefit of herself and my children, it's a totally different role. It's I could do anything I wanted and make foolish mistakes during my life, which I do, um, but my spouse is charged to a much higher standard of making sure that she administers this trust um, in a fiduciary appropriate manner for the benefit of the beneficiaries. Right. Okay. Um, if a decedent had a living trust, does that automatically mean that no probate is required? Not automatically. Uh, if the trust is drafted appropriately and funded appropriately, and by funded I mean the assets of the set law were actually transferred in title to the successor or to the trustee, um, then I probably don't need to open a probate. But oftentimes we find that um, the decedent didn't transfer everything to his or her trust. They kept certain things out, sometimes intentionally, sometimes and more frequently unintentionally. And that brings in what is commonly referred to as the pour over will. A pour over will accompanies the trust. The will's purpose is to pick up items that were not titled in the trustee's name and pick them up, take them through probate, and get them to the trust. Um, California has developed some shortcuts that allow us to, in many cases, avoid the necessity of probate of that pour over will, uh, getting a court order that confirms the intent of the set law, that if the set law, if we can show the set law one of those assets in the trust, uh, our local courts are pretty generous in uh, giving you that court order so that we don't have to open a full-blown court-supervised process. Okay. So here's another good one. Is it unusual for families to neglect the formalities of administering trusts after a death, and are there any consequences of that failure? Unfortunately, it's, it's not terribly unusual, despite our best efforts to educate clients of the importance of, you really need to contact us mm -hmm. following a death. But the reality is that many clients falsely assume that, well, we really don't need to do anything. Um, and hence, the trust may say, upon a death, we're going to divide the trust into different shares or different subtrusts. Uh, but if, we, if the surviving spouse or the trustee is just ignoring that, um, it's probably a breach of fiduciary duty, and it means that somewhere down the road we're going to have to come in and then backtrack in order to create and fund and follow the decedent's intentions. It's basically what we call cleaning up a mess. It's a big mess, and it's much more expensive <laughs> to clean it up as opposed to just doing it right from the beginning. Okay. What is community property, and why is that status important for trust administration? Uh, good question, Mike. Community property uh, is property that is acquired during the course of a marriage by either spouse's time, labor, effort, or skill. Uh, frequently, community property is the product of compensation, wages, um, independent contractor arrangements where they've taken that compensation, acquired assets during the course of the marriage, the most common being a home, for instance. Mm -hmm. The reason it's important is at the time of a death, I can only dispose of property that I own. And in California, a community property jurisdiction, I only own one half of the community property, even though I might have been the wage earner for 75% of the community property. I can only control one half of it. So my trust or my will can only dispose of what I own which is half of the community under California law. Okay. Um, 
Are there significant legal fees for administering a trust? And does having a living trust really save legal or other administration costs? Um, it's a little bit of a loaded question, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is, in generally, yes, it should save substantial uh, legal fees because the alternative to a trust administration is a probate administration. And the legal fees in a probate administration are statutory. They're based by statute, and they're a percentage of the gross estate. In most trust administrations, um, they are charged on an hourly basis based upon how much work do we really have to do. Uh, in my observation over the years, uh, I typically will tell client that in our experience, it's roughly one-third the cost of what it would be in a probate to have a trust, but it does, it's not zero because mm -hmm. there are steps that the trustee has to take. But right. it is cheaper. Okay. Um, does having a trust make it easier to access cash after a death uh, so that you can pay things like funeral costs and things like that? Um, it's about the same as a joint account. Um, what we have to do when an individual dies and there is a successor trustee is I've got to prove to the world that the successor trustee is now in fact the trustee. Mm -hmm. So in that sort of arrangement we do what's called a certification by the trustee uh, and it's addressed to whom it may concern financial institutions and the California Probate Code allows the trustee to make that certification which will allow him or her to then access the accounts generally in a day or two. Uh, so it's not immediate, but it's not a lengthy process in order to get recognized uh, as the person in charge of the decedent's assets. We may have to wait for a death certificate to be issued uh, combined with uh, the trustee certification. Okay. So you mentioned the death certificate. Maybe what is the significance of the death certificate? Um, in our experience, we found that a lot of third parties actually require proof of death. I, I can't just go in and say, Michael Gray passed yesterday, and uh, by the way, I'm his executor. Would you kindly give me his account? That's not going to work, Mike, as you well know. The um, death certificate is issued by the county in which the decedent resided, uh, and it has the date of death and all the other causes of death listed on it. And when it's certified, it's evidence to the institution, title company, Social Security that, in fact, this person is now deceased. Um, so it's utilized for a variety of purposes, collecting life insurance proceeds, um, the designated beneficiaries of a retirement plan being able to access their benefits under that plan. Um, it's required by Social Security in order to get a spousal death benefit or uh, other spousal benefits. So we're going to need a number of certified copies of death certificates following death. It varies depending upon the composition of the assets, uh, but probably at a minimum three to five uh, are generally what we'll recommend to clients. Okay. If you're nominated to be a trustee, do you have to accept? And what are some things you should think about before accepting? Um, another excellent question. It's probably the first item of business that I talk uh, with a potential trustee about because when you accept the role uh, of trustee you're taking on liability potential liability and you are taking on duties and responsibilities that the California law imposes upon you you don't have to do it you can say thank you very much but I have better things to do with my life than go out and, and administer this trust uh, and this estate uh, is it an honor? Yeah, I suppose if the decedent trusted you enough to name you as the trustee, he or she believed in you, uh, and many clients just want to carry out the wishes of the decedent. But it's important to understand that with that office comes exposure and liability. You do not have to say yes. And in fact, I'll tell my client, particularly those that, that are in ill health, uh, have other major emotional trauma going on in their lives, that you can say no and it'll pass down to the next named successor trustee. Uh, and in fact, in a case where the potential heirs and beneficiaries are quite contentious, uh, 
it might even be advantageous not to put yourself in the middle of that fight uh, because eventually you'll have the target on your back uh, and they'll be shooting arrows at you mm -hmm. for failing to administer the trust properly. Right. Uh, whether it was proper or not, they'll, they'll, if they think that you did it improperly, <laughs> oh well. Um, what about notice requirements? Uh, are there notice requirements for trusts? There is a notice requirement. Um, the very first notice requirement is a statute that uh, requires the named successor trustee to give notice to all heirs and beneficiaries. And that notice is pretty simple. It's straightforward. It says the decedent is deceased. He or she had a trust. It was amended. Here are the terms of the trust. Here's the trustee and his or her address. Here's the county where the trust is uh, the principal place of business is. And in big, bold type, there's a notice that says you have 120 days from the date you receive this in order to challenge the trust. Otherwise, a statute of limitations kicks in and says if you file a contest after that period of time, you're going to be foreclosed from pursuing it. Mm -hmm. So that first notice starts the ball rolling and starts the clock ticking as to whether or not that last trust instrument is in fact valid. Okay. So what other notices do you need to be concerned about? I mean, there's some things that really, to, that you're not really even with the trust, right? There are other assets that the decedent might have. Or. Well, the trust would only govern trust assets, and yeah. so that's the notice to the heirs and beneficiaries. Uh, other notices that you have to give are the same statutory notices that we would give in a probate. In other words, you've got to give notice to the Victims' Compensation Relief Board if the decedent was ever incarcerated. You've got to give, or if a beneficiary was incarcerated, you've got to give notice to the Department of Health Care Services to determine whether or not the decedent uh, creator of that trust was receiving any public benefits such as Medi-Cal. Um, the trustee still has a duty to um, give notice to creditors. Now, you can do it formally or informally, um, but if you totally abandon the need to give any sort of a notice, um, there's an argument that the one-year statute of limitations uh, may not begin to run as to that reasonably known creditor that you just chose to ignore. Mm -hmm. So there are options for filing a creditor claim procedure in California if you want to. Um, bottom line is most non-professional fiduciaries, family members who serve in that role, do need advice and guidance by legal counsel as to what do I have to do. Right. Um, does having a trust mean that it's going to take less time to administer the property after a death and, and why is that? Um, truth of the matter is, in most cases, yes, it does take less time. Um, I'm not going to say it takes substantially less time because you still go through the same procedures that you would under a court supervised. The only difference is you're doing it privately and not through the court system. Um, so you're still developing an inventory of the assets. You're still doing an accounting of those assets you're still making decisions as to do we sell a particular asset or keep it and distribute it in kind equally or non pro rata. Um, so a lot of the same issues that face us in a will mm -hmm. uh, context or in a probate are there in a trust. But because we're doing it privately and we can set up our meetings and telephone calls as frequently as we want, we can generally get it done faster and more economically. Are additional trusts typically created from a single living trust, and what kind of purposes can they serve, and how long do they, will they typically last? The answer has got to be general, yes. because every case is Each unique. Is yeah. uh, but for married couples, it's not uncommon that upon the death of a first spouse, that single trust will divide into two or more subtrusts. Um, we're finding with many of our clients that not as much today as it used to be uh, even five years ago. 
Um, and then for a single individual, say a surviving spouse that have children, um, oftentimes they may set up a trust for asset protection purposes for a child. Uh, sometimes what we refer to as a generation skipping trust. So it actually creates a subtrust for each of the children that can go on for the life of a child. Mm -hmm. uh, so the trust doesn't automatically terminate at death. We have to look to see what did the decedent want? What did mm -hmm. they say? What do they want? Um, more often than not, I think you're right. The assets, the trust terminates and the assets are distributed. But it's important to make sure you read the trust to determine what did the set lawyer want? What did the decedent want? Right. And there can be special reasons that we have what we call special needs trusts where uh, you may have an incapacitated uh, beneficiary, a child who's suffering from cerebral palsy or whatever. I'm just throwing something out. Uh, but anyway, the, but you want to provide for them in a way uh, maybe that you're also preserving other medical benefits that may be available to them and so on. Yeah, special needs trust is commonly used these days for any sort of disabled child that's receiving any sort of public benefits uh, because if they inherit many of the programs will cut off those public benefits. So we want to preserve all of the resources available to care for that individual. Right. Okay. Um, now here's one thing. Many of us are fairly relaxed, and I'm finding it actually more so these days, related to the personal accounting. Uh, and part of it has to do with the Internet uh, that now, uh, bank statements aren't arriving. You don't have a physical statements. Uh, and people aren't even really keeping checkbooks. They're looking online to see what says the balance is in their account and so forth. Uh, can you be that relaxed about your accounting as you're a trustee? Uh, Mike, when you're a trustee, that means, as you well know, you're a fiduciary. And as a fiduciary, uh, California law is going to impose duties and responsibilities on you. And one of those, and perhaps the most fundamental, is the duty to account for the assets that you have control over. Um, and that accounting takes the form of what has come in, what are the assets that we started with, what was their value, what has come in by way of receipts, rents, interest, dividends, royalties, etc. what has gone out, administration expenses, appraisal fees, um, sales of assets, things of that nature, and then what's available to be distributed. Uh, California law mandates an accounting, but it can be waived. So many times we will seek uh, a waiver and a release from beneficiaries, uh, and in lieu of doing a formal accounting, we will provide them with what I call informal accountings. Perhaps not in the format the court would require, mm -hmm. but enough to give them valuable information as to here are the bank statements, here's the checkbook, um, basically a, a ledger of everything that's come in and come out, uh, and see if they will be willing to waive. If not, we have to do a formalized accounting. And at that point, that means the beneficiary doesn't trust my client, and I'll probably want to get that accounting court approved right. to release my client. Right. And related to this, even when people have kept checkbooks in the past, a lot of times they'll make the deposit as a lump sum. So it's just a deposit and it have, you know, $5,000 or whatever. And uh, when we're doing this type of accounting, we need the details of what makes that deposit up really to be part of your record keeping as well. You know, the good news is in this digital age, Mike, um, when you do order, if you can get online with that account, you can actually see every check that came in on a deposit register on an individual basis. So you we're able to recreate that accounting. Um, but if I can't get online, or if my paralegal can't get online, and all I have is the statement, it's a little more problematic when we bunch our receipts together. So it is important to separate out what was this, you know, five different checks that went into the account all on the same day. Right. We only have a couple of minutes left, but I, I guess I do want to bring up uh, just briefly that this internet thing is creating some headaches because uh, people have accounts that they have access to online and they're not getting paper documents and so you don't have a very easy trail to 
pick up as to what they have. Mike, you, you've raised a point that's you know probably this digital age that we live in, and it's only going to get more prevalent, more common. We'll eventually do away with paper records realistically. Um, the problem that we're seeing is how does someone that's not in a day in day out relationship with the decedent come in and step into the role and figure out what was going on. So we've actually started in our office, and I'd recommend this to your viewers, put a letter of wishes. And in that letter of wishes, state to your successor trustee where you keep your digital records, meaning I have, here's the password to my online email so you can see that I get email statements. Uh, and they're all kept in my safety deposit box or someplace safe. Uh, there are lots of online security programs that you can keep passwords in. Uh, and I would recommend to your viewers to make sure that they communicate that uh, to their successor trustee or alternatively, just let them know where they can find those digital records. Okay. Bob, we're all out of time. Thanks again for joining me today, sharing this important information, folks. Again, this is just an introduction to this topic. That's why people like Bob are in business, uh, and me too. Anyway, uh, we'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. Thank you, Mike. <laughs>